I think because we've got a fair amount to, to work on tonight, we'll start. Um, and hopefully the couple of folks that are on the Zoom meeting uh, can hear. Um, we're recording it. Hopefully. It should work. I, I don't know how well it'll pick up, but uh, so we'll do that. And you'll also get the PowerPoint. So there's a lot of pictures and stuff like that tonight. Um, it's I, I love this meeting because it's just fun to take a look at what the potential is and uh, see how buildings are, are are being transformed, sometimes reimagined, sometimes. And so um, hopefully this will be a fun meeting for you guys as well. I'm going to apologize ahead of time. I haven't done a two and a half hour deal with a mask on yet, so we'll, we'll see how this goes. Um, yeah. It looks like I'm gasping for air. We'll take a short break. Maybe. Um, anyway, um, so. Uh, Oh, my clicker's not working. There we go. Okay, so tonight, what we're going to try to do is uh, we'll debrief uh, the facility tours that we took a few weeks back. So hopefully you guys can still kind of remember things, but obviously the higher level items that you saw will hopefully still be on your mind. Um, we're going to review um, briefly what our process is uh, and how we're gonna finish that process out over the next few weeks, just to give you a little bit of a heads up on what that looks like. And then um, we'll probably spend the majority of our time tonight really looking at modern learning designs, what that means and having a chance, obviously, as some small groups and a large group to kind of talk about some of those things as well. So, um, just want to call attention again to our meeting norms. You guys are a great group, quite frankly. So I'm not even going to repeat them, but just make sure that you're kind of getting input from everybody uh, at your groups. Um, and you know, this is great for the presentation part, but you know, if one of you guys wants to sit over here and one wants to kind of stand at a social distance area, I'll, I'll get leave it up to you whether you want to work in groups of two or if you, you two groups want to kind of come together. So, um, so anyway, just. Try to make sure you're getting output from everybody. Um, so from a tour recap standpoint, as we as we think about the tours and we talk about the tours, what I'd like to do is, is, is try to make sure that we're considering things that we've heard in the past and, and looked at relative to what you saw in the buildings. And so of course there's the assessments that we that we talked about. Um, and you saw some of that stuff and you heard about some of that stuff on the tour. But going back a little bit further than that, we we looked at what's the purpose of schools, you know, and so taking a look at what the principals told us when they came and presented to us, their their key thing, their key their presentation was keyed around three areas of your strategic plan, your strategic initiatives, which were relationships, challenging academics, and 21st century skills, all right, which is what they're hoping for and what they're doing programmatically for kids. When we looked at the Daggett video and the Ken Robinson video, right, if you remember that far back, um, some of the things that they talked about, creativity, innovation, Daggett actually talks about three hours. Relevance is, is, is a big one, but rigor and, and relationships as well. So kind of repeating that relationships. And then when we talk about 21st century skills, which everybody seems to like to talk about 21st century, many, many different organizations that have studied this and are involved in education, have kind of focused on the what they call the four C's as far as what skills our kids need today going into the future because that future is so unknown we don't know what those jobs are going to be and all those types of things and so those are critical thinking communication collaboration creativity okay um, and so as we go along and think about tours try to keep this stuff in mind and how that relates to what you saw okay so we're going to jump right into having some discussion on tours because I don't want you to forget anything more about the tours than you already have. Um, reintroduce yourself to the group because it's probably been a while. Um, what surprised you on the tour or maybe didn't surprise you that you thought you might get surprised about? Do the schools provide relevance to the real world? So we're trying to you know, get kids ready for, they often say college and career ready, right? For the real world. Are our schools giving them that from a physical standpoint? And what items that you saw that you think might want to change um, rise to the top in your mind as kind of priority items? 
Now what I'd like you to do is on your sheet, divide that out between Lambert and middle and high school, because obviously the buildings are, are different. And then if there's a catch-all that things fall into, feel free to just throw it in a catch-all category. But if we have some specific things around those, those each of those individual schools that you want to try to put out there, let's let's try to divide it up. Okay. So why don't we um, why don't we take about fifteen to twenty minutes to go through this? I want to give you guys enough time to kind of talk about it so you recall what you saw, and then I'll put, and then uh, and then we'll come together as a, a large group and we'll kind of talk about what you guys have. Okay. Gentlemen. All right. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, why don't we come back together in thought at least and uh, talk about what you guys uh, got down on this and what you talked about in your group. So, uh, just first off, what surprised you, if anything? And I'll, I'll, I'll start with you guys. Yeah. Nothing really, because I've volunteered enough in the three buildings that you've seen it. Seen it. It kind of surprised me what the principals themselves individually said was their biggest concern. Mm -hmm. The Lambert said the principal, which is principal, he's most concerned about the lighting in the classroom. He, when asked what is your number one thing that would improve the opportunity for the kids to learn, he said better lighting in every classroom. Middle school, the principal said noise control. Okay. In the high school, it was air quality. Air quality. Okay. So, other than that, everything it was kind of obvious what's going on. Me. <laughs> Anybody else surprised? I was surprised by the the, uh, the electric system in the old building high school here. Right. It seems like that's almost approaching emergency status to me. Mm-hmm. I think it's probably the least that old and it's probably right now. It, it could be. I, I mean I can't I can't say that from an assessment or an engineering perspective, but it wouldn't surprise me if it was original. Yeah. And the boiler and Lambert, the fact that that thing's still going too is Yuri said they when they say a prayer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I turn it on. So hope it starts up, right? Yeah. Yeah. So some of those systems I think it's not a lot of us have been in and out of the schools many, many, many times. Right. And those are areas that you don't quite see. So yeah. Or at least even taking note of. You know, right. I know right. in the past I mean somebody's got it, but just even the number of electrical outlets available in the classroom sometimes yeah. in the older buildings is is very scarce. Yeah. And I don't think people that are in the village regularly, they, you don't think about it unless you're looking for one, mm -hmm. you know? So um, how about you guys? Actually the same kind of thing we talked about, like, you know, John is in the school here, he's like, you know, look exactly the same really as, you know, when we were here. And then um, just the lifetime of a lot of those things, like the boiler, the electrical system, how it, it well exceeded their lifetime. Yeah. Um, and one of the other things too we said that was surprising is with like the new addition, especially for the high school, tied into like the old winery and all that kind of stuff. That has been yeah, it, it shares the utility, right? right. So it, it, even though it's newer, it's still got some of the same problems that the older does. Right. Yeah. You guys? Uh, we had a uh, similar uh, high school, I like, think. Wait, it's more than electric. Uh, color of the water. That was a surprise. Oh, yeah. That's right. <laughs> that's shocking. <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I, I've heard it, you know, brown colored water, yeah. but then I, I had to actually go and touch the, the tube because I, I just I thought it was a colored tube. Anyway. Uh, lack of space for the teacher's lounge, Lambert. Um, that was surprising. And then a little bit of storage. Uh, but then, uh, well, the principal says the teachers are for the hoarders, so maybe they need to just get rid of stuff. Too. Probably a little bit, yeah. <laughs> and then in the middle school, surprised uh, just that they have the uh, sewing machines at home. Act. You know, is that mm -hmm. really a 21st century school that all these kids are going to use one day? My wife does a lot, but I don't know about, about that. Too. Um, and then just the amount of resources, like in Lambert, it seemed like there's a lot for um, dealing with kids with behavioral issues. The space and everything related to that is that 
you have that there, or should that all be somewhere else? Go with it. Yeah. Okay. Um, great things. Not necessarily surprising things, right? And, uh, and when you get around and you look at schools, you guys are different than a lot of other school districts. So, you know, we, we hear and see a lot of the same things. But I think those are all great points. Um, how about the question as far as, um, actually, I'm going to skip. Of the things that we're talking about then, you know, between the different schools, what, what do you guys think rises to a priority level versus, you know, so we talk about things oftentimes is we need to have these things. We probably should have these things. And then we kind of like want to have these things, but they're maybe not as critical. So in, in that type of context, what do you think rises to that level in particular of need, but maybe even should have? I'll, I'll start with you guys. Yeah, obviously the, the priority being like the health, safety, and comfort first, like the air quality, the heating, the cooling, the electrical, um, so it's all just done. Yeah. Like the utility type things yes. is what you're saying are right. the, as well as security you said right Correct. safety and security Correct. so those are the need they have right yeah there's a lot of other stuff that'd be great on the wish list but yeah. i think those are the more important right off the bat yeah yeah you guys go for it <laughs> you have probably the exact same concern yeah. the hvac systems are probably something that needs to be fixed immediately and some of the other items, you know, if you can take them out before they take you out, like the electric and boiler, mm -hmm. um, then those are not easy fixes by playing a switch. So they would probably right. occupy a lot of time at that point. So yeah. I would say those are probably our heavy hitters. Um, and then maybe some configuration stuff, but and then certainly when you do the compliance issues, those have to be fixed. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, there's a few of those. <laughs> There is a couple of members of home fixtures, so I don't know about the other two buildings. Yeah, I don't know. I, I know we uh, pointed out the group that I was with, and I don't remember who was in it, but you know, some of the sinks are on the bathrooms, for instance, yeah. are not wheelchair accessible. Right. You can't get in underneath them. Um, some of the door hardware is not the lever style; it's the you know the round. Um, so um, yeah, so those are. Now, the nice thing is, is when you address some of those utility type things, there's some economies of scale. Right. Sometimes you're doing more than one of those things at the same time because they're all in the same area. Right. Or similar area. How about you guys? Pretty much exactly the same. The only things that um, we added would be like the middle school, the noise, and the just privacy issues as well. Like mm -hmm. if you got the locker rooms, um, but privacy also relates to the noise issue as well. Yeah, and then on both middle and Lambert, uh, just curb appeal of both of them. You know, there's nothing um, to draw visitors in or give them like a really nice welcome as they're entering the facilities. Yeah. Got it. Okay. So we will recircle back to that later in our process. So I appreciate you guys putting those down. Now, to the question of and this is a bit of the function part of it and what you know some of the folks like your principals were talking about as well we, we have the mechanical things which are not surprising and most groups actually elevate those like you guys did but uh what about relevance to the real world as far as what what are our, our staff is trying to do from a programming standpoint and preparing our kids what what do you guys think about that so we're going to come back to this question in a moment, but um i'll start with you guys here yeah, we said that, uh, yeah, we thought they're doing a pretty good job of laying a foundation, um, given the fact that, you know, some of the areas, they probably don't have the technology they would like to have, or some of the upgrades, like we saw the science lab, and things like that, that, you know, if you do an upgrade, you know, you can really enhance the way that these, you know, kids will learn or relate to a subject. So I'd say they're doing, um, you know, as good a job with the facilities and with the resources they have right now yeah. um, to prepare. Um, but the other thing we had was, you know, with the COVID thing going on, you know, is there a point where um, schools, buildings, et cetera, will become a little more obsolete or, you know, will stuff move to, will, will parents look to other resources rather than school building? Right. Um, 
No, it's an unknown. Sure. And, and it is an unknown. Yeah. I don't want to interrupt you. No, that's it. Okay. Um, so, yeah, and the COVID thing really does throw kind of a juggernaut in there because we, we don't know what it's going to be. Um, and uh, although, you know, I, I've been doing some reading that early on in the COVID thing, a lot of people thought, okay, you know, we're going virtual. You know, this is kind of the start of a new world of education. As we went through the three or so months of virtual, there was a lot more people that came back, at least survey wise, who were like, mm, you know what, after living with that for three months, I'm not sure if that's entirely, you know, the case. And I had one other person uh, make an analogy to me and said, you know, um, Google and Apple and Microsoft and, and some of these companies, um, you have access to the best technology in the world, the best bandwidth and everything. They still have campuses. They still have office buildings that people show up to work at every day. And there's a reason why they're all coming there for work every day. Um, and so a don't doubt that we'll probably have changes personally. Um, but I don't know if, if there'll be, and I'm not implying you guys said this, I don't know if they'll be as drastic as what some people think where we're going all virtual all the time. You know? um, so uh what do you guys have yeah i would say kind of a lot of things like Bruce was saying i think there's a lot of irrelevance um and especially with some of the different programs and readiness that they're doing the best that they can with what they have um, i think they really really do need to could they do more if they had more yes but again that's probably not on the need list but somewhere between the should or or why yeah you guys have anything to add to those I I think that's probably uh, our assessment. They're doing the best they can with what they've got. I, I was kind of thinking as we were talking about the, the shop area and how they had to be clever about timing and moving things around and exhausting air in and out in buildings. And it's just not quite the right setup, but they're doing whatever they can to make it work. Yeah. And it's providing skills to the kids that they're going to need. So, in that sense, I think they're. They're winning, but it could probably teachers are extremely right. resourceful folks. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they really are. Yeah. Um, so and the sewing machines actually it's kind of funny going through the tour now. It's like, hey, those I hope those kids are paying attention. They could be making masks, masks making yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they could be having their own uh, little business on the side. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's right. You sure. need more so people to learn how to sew as somebody who <laughs> I have a, a bridal business and we're Young people, yeah. Yes. Um, yeah. Yeah. That, with, along with a lot of other yeah. manual jobs, are going overseas, I imagine. Right. Right? Yeah. I, mean, I don't know anything about the clothing business. But, yeah. um, so, anybody have anything else they want to add as far as tours before we kind of move on? And not that we can't talk about it when we start talking about modern learning, but anything you want to wrap this up? No? Okay, cool. All right, so just briefly then, a recapping uh, or reviewing our process, because we haven't looked at this for quite some time, and I just thought this would be a good point as we kind of slide into the, the last half of what we're doing. So just as a remember, it's, it's really important to the school board and to your community that the community has a voice in this process of determining what um, the potential for moving forward is with the district. Um, you guys, uh, hopefully, will be key communicators um, in this effort. It's difficult now because we're not seeing a lot of people. We're starting to see more now, but, um, but both directions. You know, uh, again, sharing stuff that we're talking about, that you're seeing, that you're hearing, you're learning, um, but also you know, being able to bring feedback here to, to, the, to the group and your small group conversations. Um, and then uh, just kind of the unique nature of, of how this works in that you guys are going to provide uh, a recommendation to the school board, uh, some influence, if you will, on a direction forward. The school board ultimately is going to kind of decide what that direction is. If it happens to include a referendum, but there's, we'll find out at our next meeting, there's a variety of different funding mechanisms. But if it does include a referendum, they'll decide that as well. And, um, but then it comes back again to the community. And the community actually gets to decide whether the referendum is the right thing going forward. Um, and even if it's not a referendum funded type of project, um, the community still 
reelecting or not reelecting school board members based on, on, on how they're representing the community. And so um, it's, uh, it's an interesting little dynamic there that we don't always think about, um, but that's why this, this part of the process is, is really important. So um, again, here, I'm not gonna take a ton of time, but, but just remember that the school board's got a lot of different things that they're gonna consider as far as how and what that direction forward is. Um, our part in the green there is important, um, obviously, or we wouldn't be doing this, um, but, it, but it's only one component, obviously, of, of the complexity of, of what some of those decisions are. And I, obviously, as we've gone through and as, as we finish this, you're getting a little bit of a, a look at what some of that complexity is too, and especially when we start talking about uh, funding and, and those types of things. Um, so our process triangle, you know, we're still heavy in the learning and exploring uh, part of this, but as we've been going through, I don't know if you've noticed or not, but we're developing some of the priorities or at least categories of priorities that we'll come back to and we'll be able to evaluate as a group. Um, and then uh, towards the end, we'll hit options. So we're still in that lower half of the triangle, but we're progressing very quickly now towards uh, the options. Um, so just to review a little bit what those areas are that we're looking at. First, we started by looking at understanding what schools are, how they work, and how they've changed. Right? And I don't know if I used this analogy in one of our virtual meetings or not, but it's kind of like when you're going to a real estate agent, and you're saying, all right, I'm starting a business, I need a location to be at, right? And first question from the real estate agent is, okay, what kind of business are you doing? Is it an engineering firm? Is it a retail outlet? Is it a dentist office? You know, um, because without understanding what's gonna go on inside there, it's really hard to help weigh in and make decisions about what it should look like and what the investment should be. Um, and so that's what we've tried to bring forward. Um, we've all been in school, but schools have changed so much since we've all been in school that it's really important to try to set that baseline as we go along. Um, and uh, as we went through these things virtually, it was a little bit arduous. Um, normally we'd go through, pro progress through these fairly quickly. Um, so then we moved to understanding what the current conditions of the schools are. So we had Sharon in, if you recall, we looked at the building assessments, um, took a look at infrastructure, building systems, learning environment, those types of things. Tried to understand a little bit about that. Then we toured the facility so we could see for ourselves what this stuff all meant, both relating it back to what schools are supposed to be. And then uh, the, uh, the uh, current condition uh, component of that, some of that we just talked about here, obviously. Um, and then going forward, understanding what could be. So this is what the rest of tonight will be current modern learning designs um, and what that looks like and how that plays into addressing uh, things before. Uh, costs, funding options, cost impact of making changes, obviously a really big component of this will be at our next meeting on the 29th. Uh, so Lynette is gonna uh, take part of that. So talk a little bit about the district's, <laughs> the district's uh, finance position and all that type of stuff and how some of that stuff works. And then the district's financial advisor is also going to be here to talk about some of the, the, the bigger components, in particular, how some of these projects could be funded and what that looks like. Okay. Um, then we'll go through a meeting where we take a look at these priorities that you guys have kind of been developing and come around what those priorities and what those options might be as far as a recommendation or what those options for moving forward would look like. And then um, really kind of work around how, how do we try to decide what those things are. And then the last meeting that we've got will be primarily taking those priorities and those options that we've developed and look at trying to form some kind of consensus around a recommendation that we take to the board, okay? So as you can see, there are seven bullet points up there our regular process had about seven or eight meetings on it. So usually we take each one of those in, in a meeting. And, uh, but obviously because of our current situation, it kind of got pushed out a little bit. So um, when we do that, and just to keep in your mind as we're going through this, one of the things that we'll talk about is trying to answer three questions. And hopefully all three of them in the affirmative makes a good recommendation. But we talk about, is the recommendation best for kids, okay? 
is the recommendation fiscally responsible? And then lastly, is the recommendation politically acceptable, right? Without those three questions being answered, yes, it's really difficult to move forward. And so where I may think that this is a really great idea, I kind of got to check myself against these questions here and say, can we answer, can we answer yes to all these on, on a particular option? So um, just, you know, think about that in the back of your mind and that'll become more relevant a little bit later as we go. So any questions on the process before we get into modern learning environments? No? Okay. Just checking to see. You. <clears throat> we should have pretty good time here. All right, so this next part here, when we're looking at modern learning environments and uh, what those look like and how they relate to schools, kind of back up a little bit and take a look at what the history of public school is in this country, All right? So public schools really kind of got their start in the 1800s. Um, and it was kind of an agricultural model at that time. Um, most students really only progress through the primary grades. The big intention was, can you learn how to read? Can you learn how to do some basic math? Can you learn what those things are to work on the farm, work in a blacksmith shop, you know, that type of thing, okay? Um, uh, not a lot of kids went on to secondary or high school type of education as we know it today. Then around the turn of the century, we had this thing called the Industrial Revolution, right? And so our schools changed quite a bit around that time to address the needs of the Industrial Revolution. And so uh, that's when our schools started to look more like what we all remember seeing in our schools, where um, they were designed to train students, generally speaking, for jobs in manufacturing, or in the case of women, I apologize for saying this, but you know, at that time, to train you to be a homemaker, right? Um, and so you had classes like home economics. Um, but, but schools were very structured, just like a manufacturing environment would be. Um, they were very individual. Um, we had bells to move from doing this task, which might be math, to moving to do this task, which might be social studies. And, and it mimicked that, that uh, industrial model, if you will. And so, um, and most kids, 80, 90% of kids went into some type of a manufacturing job or manufacturing support type of job. So you think about uh, when I was in high school, typing was a high school level class, right? And again, at that, at that time when it was designed, not so much when I was in high school, but you know, again, women were training to be secretaries or be part of the typing pool that they had in the offices and that type of thing. So um, that's, that's what schools were designed around. Now we're in the, into the 2000s, right? And now we've really kind of left a lot of that industrial model behind. We're just talking most of our manual labor types of functions have either been automated or they're gone overseas, right? And so now what they're kind of turning the age that we're in is the global information and innovation model of schools, or that's the kind of the age we're in. Um, and we're looking to design uh, our schools to develop higher uh, thinking skills in students uh, because now you've got information easily available to you. Um, the manual labor types of functions are, are not there anymore. And so now we're trying to do creative things. So th this is where you see the collaboration skills, the creativity skills, the innovation stuff, um, a lot of the STEM stuff because somebody's got to invent the robots that are doing the, the, the manual labor, you know, and those types of things. And so that's where we're at today, okay? Um, now, when we think about global information and innovation, again, I bring back these three things that we looked at uh, just a little bit ago relative to the buildings. But as I was mentioning, these things tie directly into that, uh, that type of model uh, of education that we're trying to bring our kids around. So the relationships with people, um, 21st century skills, the critical thinking, the communication, the collaboration, the creativity, those aren't manual labor type skills, those are higher thinking skills. Um, and, uh, and you can see the same things from Bill Daggett and, and Ken Robinson. And if you remember the Bill Daggett video that we all watched, um, he talked a lot about what those jobs likely are to be uh, that, that we're seeing. So 
I found this graphic and I thought it was, was uh, particularly good. When you take a look at 20th, 20th century school, which most of us all went through, um, it was time-based versus now we're talking about outcome-based, right? So everything we, we, what that means is, is we progressed from first grade to second grade, for instance, to third grade, based on our age, based on another year, based on time. And now, we're trying to go more towards outcome based, you know, where are you at in your in your learning. Um, textbook driven versus research driven passive learning teacher centered fragmented curriculum. Um, what those things are is that the passive learning was you listen to the teacher. Right, which is, is part of the teacher centered, uh, centered thing. You listen to the teacher. They instructed you. They told you what you needed to know. You memorized it. You wrote notes. You learned it. It was on your own. Is an individual type of thing. Um, and your curriculum was you did that in math class and then you closed up your math book and you put it in your backpack or probably carried it under your arm at that time. And then you went to social studies and you learned social studies. And there is no connection necessarily between those two things. Now, the active learning is we've got kids in groups, right? They're working together to learn things. It's student centered learning, not teacher centered learning. So you've got groups of kids working on project-based learning. The teacher may do a 10 or a 15 minute instructional thing, then let the kids work together, help them you know, teach each other about some of these things, come back, uh, those types of things. Um, and then the integrated curriculum part is, is now we're trying to tie math to social studies or social studies to English. And you're seeing some schools even go to a liberal arts type of class, which combines the social studies and the English into one class. Um, and so there's a lot more integration that way. Printed assessments versus a wide variety of assessments that we have today. Um, uh, everything was in print textbooks, essentially. Um, now we learn through all kinds of multimedia uh, types of things. And I, I don't know about here, but you're probably not using as many textbooks today as you were 15 years ago. You know, I know my kids are like, all my textbook stuff's on the, on the computer. So, um, and then um, isolation versus collaboration. Again, that's that idea of I'm learning what I learn, right? I take my notes, I take my test, I do my paper, but it's me, right? Not a lot of project-based work back then where we're seeing a lot more project-based work in a lot of different classes now. Um, and then facts and memorization, because at that time you needed to, no stuff, right? Data was important. Knowledge was power, right? Now, anything you ever want to know, you know, is, is right, right here. Every bit of information you want, you can access immediately for free, right? So now the higher order thinking thing is, what do you do with that information? How do you discern whether it's good information or not? How does it provide value? to what you're really ultimately trying to do and how do you take that information now and use it for something? Whereas before a lot of it was just memorization types of stuff, right? I mean, how many people had a test on what the capitals of the states are, you know, or what the capitals of all the countries in Europe are, right? Not a lot of that happening. These, I'm not saying it doesn't happen at all, but not a lot of that happening these days because it's very easy to find out what it is if you want to know. Does that make sense? Anybody got thoughts or comments on that? No? Okay. All right, so I always find this a little bit interesting. So how have schools changed? So obviously we didn't hit 1900 and like a light switch, we switched models, right? And then we hit 2000 and we switched model. So it's, it's a progressive thing, obviously. And so we've been progressing into this 21st century type of thing for some time. Those of us that went to the school later, you know, 80s, 90s, it wasn't me, unfortunately, but, um, you know, we're, we're already progressing into some of those types of things, right? But how have our schools changed and adapted in their design to accommodate that, right? So hopefully you can see most of these pictures. Classroom picture from 1920, right? About what we probably expect. Classroom picture from 1930, about the same, right? Rows of desks, teacher standing in front at a blackboard. Um, kids got their books out. What's interesting to me is all the desks were two-person desks at that time. 
1940. And I, I intentionally made sure we had pictures in here that had dates on them so that people believed, you know, when the pictures were taken. So there's 1940, right? Um, so those are the desks. And if you notice, it's mighty hard to notice, but these, these, these are the desks still that are attached to the floor. So you're not moving them around in the classroom either. They're, they're, they are where they are. So even just imagine if you're a tall kid, you know, and you're trying to squeeze into a, uh, into a desk that can't even move. So there's 1950. Still looking about the same. Teacher in the front of the class, nice rows, right? Um, there, they're having music class, right, in that class. She's teaching singing of some sort in there. 1960, there is a date, you can't see it real well, but it does say 1959-60 school year, All right? So again, same, same look. It, it also amazes me that kids are like dressed up, sitting there with their hands crossed, you know. Um, <laughs> yeah, I know, right? <laughs> So 1970, we got color film at least. Um, but again, high, high school picture, again, desks in rows. Um, again, teacher clearly instructing what they need to know. Um, not a lot of changes there in what the classroom looks like at all and how things are being done. 1980, it's about the time I was in elementary school, I think. Um, and uh, uh, there again, not a lot of changes. 1990, you're seeing some changes, a little bit more flexible furniture, but it's still set up essentially in rows with the teacher in the front at the board, you know. So the point is, at least through this decade, or, um, you know, there's not been a ton of change in our classrooms, even though the world changed a lot in that period of time from a technology standpoint, from a jobs type of standpoint, from a societal standpoint. But yet, the schools all look the same. So I thought this was uh, kind of a neat cartoon. You got a uh, kid there that's obviously, you know, long hair, baggy pants and shirt, you know. Um, how can I trust your information when you're using such outdated technology? You know, and I wonder how many of our kids sort of at least feel a little bit like that when they're in our schools and saying, all right, I'm trying to learn relevant information and, and these types of things. And we've done a pretty good job as schools, generally speaking, you know, broad, broad based of getting technology into the classroom and one to one, you know, types of things. But what do our schools look like? They're relevant to the real world, especially when you get into high school and kids start having jobs and maybe some internships and that type of thing. And then they're coming back to school and saying, wow, this doesn't look at all like what it is out there. Um, so, so here's a couple of classrooms from the 20 teens. And we are finally starting to make a change, but obviously a lot of classrooms, and you saw it here too, a lot of classrooms still, you know, set up like the traditional 1900s model classroom. Um, and so, um, so what you're seeing up here, obviously is flexible furniture. You don't see desks. Um, you don't see a, a teacher desk. You know, so in almost all those other pictures, you could identify the teacher desk in the front of the room. Um, there's no teacher desk here. Um, I do like this, for instance, little tiki hut with some uh, with some uh, little small lawn chairs in there for reading. You got some computers on the desk. All right, so so that's that's now what we're starting to see in the 2000s as far as as a more modern learning environment. So as we go through and we look at the different things that I've got here, I want to caution you that some of these things are going to look rather fancy and they're going to look new and they're going to look like a college campus in some cases, right? Because that's what architects always like to put forward promotionally and what have you. Um, but look past that because that part's not important, that it's new and fancy. Look for how we're using space. Look at the furniture types that you see. Look at the use of color in the school. In, in the, in the school. The, the colors have meaning. Um, I can bring my cheat sheet, so I can't tell you which colors mean what exactly, but they, but they generate certain emotions in kids. Um, 
look at natural light, right? So your elementary school teacher talked about lighting, right? That is that is a very big thing as, as far as either natural light or going to LED, which is on the same type of light spectrum. Um, and then look at how the rooms are set up as being student centered versus teacher centered. Okay. So those are the things we're going to look at. Don't look at the architecture. All right, the other thing is that not everything has to be new, as I mentioned. So a lot of concepts can be duplicated. So the picture on the left is a school that is was is new in the last two years, all right? So open kind of uh, uh, personalized learning type of concept for elementary school. There's eight classrooms around an open common area. And these kids are all doing some group work in this open common area. Uh, and so it's a great model, you know, um, for kids again from a collaboration standpoint, from a creativity standpoint, um, and it just allows them to work in a matter where they're comfortable working, so that they can focus on their work and not while they're sitting or, or whatever. Um, so, but there's the same thing happening in the second picture, and I don't know how well you can see that entirely. But in that second picture, that is being done in a building that was built in the mid Okay, So you don't have to have a brand new building to employ some of the concepts that are here. Some tweaks uh, can be done. So here you've got uh, three classrooms that were next to each other that were opened up in between each other. And then one that was on the back wall that was a science lab with the door put through to the science lab. So now you brought four classes together these four classrooms and you're teaching kids in groups and there's some freedom and there's some you know, a lot of these uh, pictures I'll point out but there is there is more formal instruction area and then there's less formal instruction area <clears throat> and it's it's a little bit more family like if you will um, but you still get all those things and you're able to easily integrate now your subject matter okay so those are some of the things you can do architecturally but it doesn't have to be in a brand new building it's great when it is, but all the same things can be done in the building from the floor. In that way, architects are really perfect. All right, so looking at learning spaces and classroom type spaces. So I'm just throwing out a, a variety of things, just, just to open up your mind, get you thinking a little bit out of the box on some of the things that could be. Um, so, you know, here you've got space being used that's kind of common space so it's kind of a bit of a hallway-ish area here where people are passing through instruction going on here standing working on tables i guess again as it's a bit of instruction and a bit of uh, uh, learning and exploring with the kids and then instruction again um smaller classroom here smaller group of kids that that instructor may be in and out of this room and, and working with some different groups of kids um but uh, a little bit more smaller collaborative type of approach. But again, look at the furniture, right? This is these uh, types of chairs. I think I saw, do you guys have chairs like this with the base on them with wheels? Um, I thought I saw some though. Um, but they're great, they're great pieces of furniture because you can throw your backpack underneath, they roll, um, and you can have any configuration you want. Um, natural light. Um, why not have your classroom look a little bit like a conference room? Right? And that's how a lot of our work gets done as professionals is, is in a conference room or a conference room type of, 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 of setup. So why not bring your kids around a U-shaped table uh, or setup where they can see each other as, as they're working through things, right? Um, this happens to be, and I don't know if it was built this way or if it was modified this way, but you can see that this room can be split. So it may have been two classrooms at one time um, and then opened up. Um, and so again, natural light. Uh, here's another one of those more open uh, learning style spaces. So you've got a variety of different instruction going on here. You've got kind of a lab or a uh, uh, major space type of area there. You've got some accommodation for tall kids and short kids. Um, again, color, red floor, orange up here. Um, you've got the uh, clear story uh, windows up here. Um, this is what I like too. This is a little bit of open space. There's a, a classroom here, and there's a classroom here. There's stairs here. 
these kids, if, if you look close enough, they're grouped up. There's a parent here, there's three here, there's two there, there's three here, there's two there, right? And so, again, they're doing this type of instruction where I'm sure he's talking about something, then they're going back to the small group, they're working on some things, then he's giving a little bit more instruction, they're going back and forth. It's not fancy, concrete floor, no fancy ceiling in there. Um, but again, you got color, you got multiple uh, choice. Um, high school class. Uh, so the picture that you saw where we, uh, before we started the classroom pictures where the kids were all together in those groups uh, doing that, uh, that group stuff. So those, those had the uh, uh, classrooms opening up into a common space. This is kind of a high school version of that. Um, again, you know, this type of thing can be done. Maybe not exactly like that, but those types of things can be done. So looking at some STEM and some robotic uh, CTE type uh, functions. Uh, this here is a food lab. Uh, so you need to think about home hack. It's not really home hack anymore, right? Uh, I'm not teaching those same things. Um, but here you're probably looking at restaurants, kids that want to be chefs maybe someday, um, or uh, that type of thing. Um, again, science lab here with, you know, Classrooms here that are shared, so you've got some formal instruction with some shared uh, lab space in between. Um, <clears throat> this is a uh, engineering or, or math uh, type of uh, lab space. We we're looking at the declines and assuming acceleration, that type of thing. Again, natural light. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, this is a uh, what we probably typically call a tech ed shop space. You've got your shop space, but they just built into it a clean room space, which is applicable to many uh, functions these days uh, in business. And so if you're doing robots or that type of thing, you can do your manufacturing stuff out here, maybe part of a metal shop equipment out here, but then you get a clean room environment area to work on the electronics. Um, I thought this is great use of space. This is just a plain, you know, almost looks like a utility type room. Um, they put some netting up around the walls. They've got a bunch of different sensors and stuff like that in here. And it's a drone lab, right? So the kids are doing some stuff with drones. Again, this isn't expensive stuff to do, um, but, but, but creative as far as, as looking at how, again, we deliver instruction and we allow kids to embrace creativity and innovation. Uh, again, robotics lab, uh, you know, tech ed type space. Again, um, concrete floor, concrete walls, no uh, fancy ceiling, right? So not expensive space again, just creative use of space. Uh, I really like this too. This is obviously in a, in, in a reimagined space because this is not new, um, but here, I uh, don't have a formal greenhouse outside, but kids are doing hydroponics here, you know? And so perhaps part of an FFA or at least a, a type of, of class, um, but uh, the Center for Hydroponics, and again, it's, it's reimagined space um, that, again, it's not an expensive greenhouse uh, or what have you, um, but they're able to really, you know, dive into that type of learning well. Um, storage space. So um, you'll see in a video that I show you in a, in a few minutes where um, storage space is kind of sometimes converted to be used as educational space as well. And one of the things that we like to try to do, so the concept behind the class, uh, again, that very first picture you saw, the kids sitting around and you had this common area and the classrooms aren't right, no hallways in there to speak of. And that's because we want to try to use every square foot we can for educational purposes. You think about how much of your building, percentage-wise of square feet, is dedicated to always that is used three or four minutes each hour. You know, um, could we use that space a different way? All right, learning comments. Um, so a lot of times we'll see cafeterias combined with study halls or learning type spaces. Um, so that's kind of what you're going to be seeing here is, is what now they're kind of referring to as learning commons. Um, here's an indoor outdoor type of one. Um, so um, we've got some outdoor space here that they can very easily kind of move uh, between. Um, 
or have more suitable for a long appointment, but um, they do have two custody windows in here, so. <laughs> Um, again, a learning commons area with some classroom space uh, around it. Um, and again, kids can come out here, they can draw on the walls, they can figure out creativity things, you know, again, some flexible furniture, but again, look at the colors. Right? Um, here's another one. Same type of thing. You see more of this where you've got screens set up with like a small conference table so you can collaborate. But then using Chromecast or um, uh, or Apple TV, you know, type of thing, easily, you know, one of the kids can connect their their device, their Chromebook, up to that, so that the whole group can kind of take a look at what they're doing. Um, we're seeing a little bit more of that type of thing employed either in learning commons or in classrooms. Um, here's another uh, space up there. Yeah, not a lot of fancy ceilings and that type of thing. Utilities are closed. Um, I like this one. This looks like a higher end uh, type of area. Um, but just showing bringing the outside in, you know, with just a camp light. So again, it's interesting for kids. Um, another one that's uh, kind of combined cafeteria and uh, learning and study hall type space. Again, flexible seating, interesting design, color. Uh, light, you know, it's all LED lit, so it's it's bright, it's it's daylight spectrum. Um, you see a lot of these in the two-story buildings now, um, where it's just a different way to uh, get yourself upstairs. Those are harder to change an existing building to, um, but uh, and breakout spaces and and collaboration and just what they call nesting spaces. Especially for the young kids. Um, but again, you can see collaboration spaces that kind of double a little bit as, as food service. And some schools now are actually going to what's called a distributed food service. So it's a smaller stop and shop versus restaurant, if you will, in the cafeteria, um, where you can get you know some fruit or you can get a, a coffee or a water or something like that, you know, nearly any time during the day. Um, again. Used to be a hallway, but just more creatively uh, configured. Um, I love this for the elementary kids. You know, and sometimes kids just need to get a little bit of a long time, you know, um, especially if you're introverted. I, I am not. Um, I know that comes as a surprise to people. Uh, but my daughter is extremely introverted. And she, before I understood the whole idea around introvert, extrovert, you know, she would, you know, escape every Sunday to her room. She just wouldn't come out, you know, and thought something was wrong. But introverts need your own time if any of you guys are introverts. You need your, your, your own time. That's how you recharge, right? So for me, it's being around people. For them, it's not. So sometimes kids just need a place to be. Um, but yet they can't be locked away, right? They still need to be visible. They need to be supervised. Um, and so it's just kind of a, a fun place for them to read a book or just take a few minutes. Again, colors and shapes, um, more of a high school uh, atmosphere. And again, you know, regular, could be just regular space, but again, they, they more creatively use it. Um, small collaboration rooms, right? So you've got uh, four, five, six kids that can come in here, work out some things. Again, the instructor might be popping around with a couple of different groups of kids, um, but it gives them the ability to do this. And you see a lot more of this type of thing in in business these days, you know, where you're trying to take that information that we've got available to us, whittle it down into something valuable. Um, again, another space that can be used as more formal instruction or not. Uh, but again, these these walls you can write on, right? And those are not that hard to do. You can get paint and these dry erase paint and, and those types of things. Libraries and media centers. So our libraries are becoming less library. In fact, you guys have you know, um, a, 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 a bit of an upgraded library here, or a more modern library, right? The, the furniture in here is, is more modern. Um, you get some of the other stuff, you get the computer lab in here, right? Um, and so it's not just rolls and rolls of books. And that's that's kind of what you're gonna see here as well. Um, for the kids at the uh, elementary level, again, color, um, physical, or, uh, visible stimulation, um, so not the books, 
right? But again, now they're explaining books more creatively, giving kids uh, different ways and different places they can read. Like, because most of us, if we're going to sit down and read a novel, we're probably not going to sit like we would normally sit in the school desk, right? That, that would not be our choice. Um, we'd probably curl up on the couch or we'd sit in a lawn chair outside or something. Um, and so we're trying to, to, to not limit kids uh, by, by those physical things. And again, existing space, easy enough to, to do something like this. Um, other library space is flexible. Um, a lot of computer lab type stuff, you know, uh, uh, for example, color something about bar. Now it's not my world. Getting out of so that's kind of like that. And then some outdoor learning spaces. And you can do these where they're secure. You know? And again, you gotta evaluate you know how much outdoor time we will get in school. Um, but there are some kind of neat, you know, like uh, blackboards for writing and that type of stuff outside. Um, here's, you know, it's a secure area, clearly, uh, but at least get them outside, fresh air. Um, very simple type of thing here to do. Um, sometimes it's in the courtyard. All right, so any, any questions or thoughts on that? It, it was to me. All right, so I'm going to just play this video and I'm going to probably uh, pause it a little bit in between just to show you. But what this is what this is going to show is that as you're thinking about things that might be able to be a part of your recommendation and, or ways that things can change, um, this video kind of walks through a uh, smaller elementary middle school, traditional in design and how that school is able to be adapted to more of the uh, things that you saw in in these uh, modern learning environments. Um, so we'll see how this works. And I, I don't have the new splash screen on it, so it still says UNESCO Power by site library. Oops, shoot. Okay, so so here's your school. Um, this is the elementary wing here with just classrooms stacked along the hallway, middle school wing, classrooms stacked along the hallway, a science edition that was done at some point afterwards, main office, main entry, cafeteria, gym, library. Okay. Kind of a, a, a basic school, if you will. And now it's going to tell you a few of the things I told you. I just don't know if I can ever keep up with the speed of the video. And I've seen all these things done, not necessarily at one school at one time, but I've seen all these things done in various places as far as I know. All right, so here's it's going to walk through the, the secure entryway. So we talked a little bit about secure entry on your tour, I think. And um, we also talk, uh, this will just show you how that can be changed. So you change the office and you create a vestibule here. And you're going to see up, up in this uh, screen here how you walk in. I'm going to walk in through this door into the office first and then come out into the school. All right, so fairly easy modification when when you generally. All right, so here's your elementary classroom. And this is taking you to um, where that uh, concept that you saw in the very, very first picture, again, where you've got classrooms around learning spaces and you're utilizing all the square footage and uh, you're getting rid of the hallway. And so you've got some flexible classroom space, small group breakout rooms in this space and this space, got a maker space, got a project area, got some small group areas, you got a reading specific space, 
and any common space in between. We can actually serve more kids in this type of a design than we can usually in a standard room structure. And you can do varying degrees of this. Well, you'll we'll see that in the middle of the, the middle slide. That's that reading comments area. Well, I'm not suggesting that you need to switch your elementary school over to this, but what I just tried to do is open your minds to things that actually are possible. How many of the, the programs you've seen like this? How do they handle the timing around the learning day? Because some of these environments look really cool. And yeah. They're places that kids are going to want to be. Mm -hmm. But children are not responsible enough to manage their time necessarily yeah. in all instances. So, how do they handle the progression of kids through these environments? Um, what you find when you're moving to that. Um, a, a lot of times, and I'm, I, I may speak incorrectly, so don't get mad at me when you're leaving. So you're not going to get mad. I don't want to call. No, but what you'll find is, is in the traditional classroom model, and, and what I remember at least of my schooling, right? I went to my class, I had my teacher, and that was that. You know, right? And, and what you see is, is in these types of models, and you know, teachers need to have some professional development around it, that type of thing. But there's, it's a more collaborative approach uh, to teaching them as well. And so you've got kids in a wide variety of different areas and it's not completely unstructured, you know, time. I mean, the right. time is structured. And so you know, these kids might be in reading now or these kids might be at maker spaces and, um, and the teachers in that, in that group are collaboratively working together. And, and that's, that's how they tend to manage it. So, um, so it's not free for all. I mean, has anyone ever seen, I thought that you would have, but, um, the new school, the middle school is built in Charleston. Yeah. Uh, I think you see it several years back, uh, right after they built it. And how many things, I mean, they have, like, they had a walking trail for the community to use right down the middle of the hallways and through the cafeteria. And I was thinking, how many more do we have security? And it was really interesting to look at because. It looked very much like this. There were spaces like there were pods of classrooms, and there was lockers. It was a middle school. There were lockers with common areas in the middle, and then five classrooms. I think it was that, like a hub. Like the locker area is a hub. Right now we have our locker areas in this long hallway. And when I see the thing about hallways, that is a huge discipline area problem for hallways because you have hundreds of kids moving at the same time. It's very hard for teachers to be. Where that you know you'll be down here and something's going on over there and can't get to you because there are 100 kids in the way or 200 kids. So this was a hub, and they had like a, a fifth grade hub and then sixth grade hub on different floors. And so and the teachers would sort of decide who needed the classroom. I don't know how they made it work, but it was like one of the classrooms was bigger and they needed it for like some science activities, and so they would switch classrooms on a regular basis. Um, they really made it work and they had those little nooks and things like that and there were times during the day that they're given the freedom to go do that. Um, so it is absolutely something to figure out how to handle differently. But it was really interesting um, to see what Charles City had done. It was completely different than anything I've ever seen. It was beautiful, beautiful. Um, I can see that requiring a lot of collaboration beforehand by the teachers to yeah. make sure that about this area during this time. Right. But we really do, um, and I don't know, I mean, there are some things I think, well, there, there are truly some practical issues you have to consider. Okay? But we do have PLCs already set up so our teachers are meeting on a regular basis. And we already have something similar at the high school where um, they tend to trade the use of the science lab. Um, so for the most part, one of the teachers has that chemistry lab, but the physics teacher has a different classroom. And they will trade because I need the I need the lab tomorrow and my room's not set up, so they'll trade. And they just they just do it themselves. They just collaborate really well. So really great questions, but I've seen it work pretty well. 
But I, I wonder about the thinking too. Like I, yeah. I wonder about supervision and some of those yeah. little nooks and crannies things. Yeah. You know, and some of the older kids can handle it better than some of the younger kids. <laughs> so, sometimes the younger kids can yeah. be I have seen kids. it though. I mean, Charles City built this. It's beautiful. If you walk into it, you just go, oh my goodness. I, it's it's unbelievable. It's noticeable. So, did you talk to any of the staff? What did they think about it? It didn't. There was, okay. you know, I must come in the summer. I talked to the principal, and he loved it. Uh, the principal, no, he was the superintendent. And they, they really liked it. But, um, it, it it, it's a different space. way of, of doing it things and, and it, mm -hmm. it gave more collaborative spaces which is something we're working on anyway is for kids to see themselves working in small groups like you would in, in business kind of but it's definitely a different way to manage the craft um but it's it's a different thing to get your head around it like this uh, part of what i find appealing to it is i mean i don't know about any of you but i have a certain chair in my house i like to sit at when i'm leaving because it's comfortable it's I got a decorated there. I like it. It's really appealing to sit there. And I prefer that space. It, you can read anywhere, right? But I want that space. Sometimes I go to the coffee shop in Cedar Rapids. I have coffee at my house. I go there and read because I like the space. Yeah. So, you know, it's just kind of, I, that's not all the lines about, but the big colors and all that kind of stuff that intrigues me in terms of kids being excited and about being there because the space is so sort of I was just reading a study that said 50, roughly 50% 50 of high school kids across the country will report that they do not feel engaged in, in, in school. And they're the ones that have the highest absenteeism, the ones that um, uh, tend to drop out uh, oftentimes. Uh, and, and a lot of it is because they're bored or they're just not feeling connected you know, with, with their school, some of which is, can be environmental, you know, some of it's other things, obviously. Um, there's no right, definite right answer and wrong answer. Um, there's a lot of benefits to doing things like we just saw up here. Um, and, uh, but, but there's drawbacks to that too. I mean, there's drawbacks to everything. One of the things when you're talking about the teachers and the collaboration is that we'll see a lot of times in these designs that where the teachers are collaborating and they have they don't have their desk, their quote unquote office space in the classroom because it's not their classroom per se, right? right. They're moving around. So there, there's a teacher office area. It's a teacher collaboration space. So they're collaborating just like we're asking students to do. And so all of their kind of desks, files, their kids' pictures, you know, are, are in that particular space. So they can plan together. They can interact about kids, you know, and uh, things that they're seeing about kids. and. Uh, I remember talking to um, a group of parents that had come together in one of the schools that was designed similarly. I think this uh, was a high school. Um, but one of the parents said one of the really great benefits is um, that kids don't get lost as easily. There's always somebody looking out for them um, because there's, there's just more people around and more adults around and different people, you know. Uh, and so I, I just thought that was an interesting observation from their standpoint. I don't know if that's the case for everybody, but it was an interesting observation. So. It is like you said, there's so many pros and cons because there's really some advantages to having like collaborative spaces and having uh, lots more like kids working together and this is our hub instead of this is my spot and that stuff. On the other hand, we also have to be a little bit careful because I don't know if anybody remember like the 1970s, they built these open space classrooms, <laughs> yeah. which had no like walls and no um, ceilings. It was all about collaboration. And then pretty soon after that, they started walling them in because it's so loud. <coughs> you, you, can't, you can't concentrate. So sometimes it looks really pretty on paper and you get in there and you go, this is ridiculous i need mean, right. yeah <laughs> so well, that's uh, that's where you want the flexibility right we have one of those schools in our district if you got five grades four sections in each grade so that's 20 classrooms if you will and the library media center all in one big room <laughs> yeah. and uh so they've done some things to try to uh keep the noise down um and, and there's a lot more things architecturally you can do design wise Baffle wise, those, those types of things to help keep nice. But you won't, you'll, you'll never see that anymore. You know, you'll see that type of concept employed with walls and doors that are, are closable. So that very first picture I keep referring back to, but you know, that particular design, you've got eight classrooms around a common area. Now, all those classrooms can open up in kind of that large group room because there's big glass doors that can open up 
and basically the, the entire wall that faces that common area can open up so they can all be open together, right? But you can close those down and it's two, it, the classrooms are paired up. So it's two on this side, two on this side, two on this side. And each of those classrooms can open up to each other. So you can kind of have a, a shared classroom experience or they can be closed down into eight individual classrooms. So there's a lot more flexibility there than there used to be. So, um, so this is the library. Again, just changing the, the, the function of the library and, and making it more appealing, not huge changes. Six, eight classrooms, they didn't necessarily want to do quite to the extent that they did at the elementary level, but again, classrooms, open them up to each other. And so you had some different uses in those spaces. So again, there are more individual classrooms, but the way that they're set up allows for a variety of different uses in those classroom spaces. And similarly done in the, uh, in the science lab area. And so then here, what you're gonna see them doing, um, that's the existing of course, but you'll see them kind of combining the science lab with some tech ed type stuff. So you've got more of a STEM experience. Um, and that'll play out here in just a second. That's where you get a little bit of that storage plus uh, instructional space. That can be used for some lab activity. Always still the same. A lot more glass. More of your science type lab space. Again, this isn't a huge school either, so we're not dealing with as many kids and then probably as we're here. We're here, we're here. But then on the other side of that door, you can kind of see more of a tech ed type space where you're combining that into a more of a STEM suite is, is what they call it. And then we've seen more of this type of thing going on with uh, like a glass garage door. So it acts as a window. It can be also opened up so you can spill out to outside uh, at times if, if that's beneficial for, for what you're doing. One of the basic changes, but changing over the playground essentially. Um, and this is this is important when you talk about uh, ABA. And I haven't been on your playground, so I don't know if your situation is here. But oftentimes you'll see the playground equipment out there, wood chips, and then like a railroad tie type of curbing around it, so the wood chips don't end up all over the lawn. Um, but that's not ADA compliant, right? Because a you can't get over the curb, um, and b once you're in the wood chips, you can't use a wheelchair in the wood chips either. Um, and so now they go into more of this uh, foam rubber type of uh, thing where you can run a wheelchair, it's easier to use crutches on, but it's still a softer play space, so it's a little safer. Uh, and then there's a whole myriad of playground equipment. I think uh, our group was talking about some of the new playground equipment that was at the elementary school. I think we were talking to the principal there, but it's not cheap stuff. <laughs> Traditional cafeteria. Change the furniture over into it, so it becomes a learning commons area. Add some windows. So you're letting a lot of light natural light in there. It just changes kind of the whole vibe of, of, of the room. It doesn't require a new school to be built for it. It's just going to recap this, so I'm just going to go forward. So, one of the questions I know I've gotten by a lot of groups is, is reimagining the space, you know, um, just putting lipstick on a pig. 
you know, are, are, I mean, are we really going the right direction here? Um, or should, or, or do we need to build new? And we have to wait until we can afford to build something new. Um, and that's just not the case. You know, when you do this work, um, a lot of times the bones are very good, you know, in the buildings. Um, and they can be reimagined and building systems can be switched over uh, to new stuff uh, in a much more economical way than having to build anything new. Um, and so I'll just show you some pictures of a, a project that's going on uh, this summer actually over in Minnesota, a school district. So they've got a school that was built part of it in the late 50s, uh, which is the part that is in this picture right here, and part of it in 1937, right? So it's an old building, um, not unlike your buildings, you know, it was, it was similar to that. It's an elementary school. Um, uh, about 200-ish kids or so going there. Um, I can't remember exactly how many kids are in your elementary school. Right off the top of my head, but... Okay, so it's a little bit smaller than, than yours, but... Um, so anyway, so this, this was the main office, right? So just looking at the level of reimagining and retrofitting that can happen, um, that was the main office. And uh, so, they're doing new heating, so H HVAC uh, heating and ventilation systems, adding the air conditioning, um, uh, replacing windows, uh, replacing lighting, um, and uh, doing a secure entryway and a secure entryway before. Um, and so that that was the office space. That's the hallway. Looking down the hallway, with the, the classrooms are on both sides of that hallway. Um, so which you'll you'll be able to see, I think, in the next picture. Yeah, so there's um, there's one of the classrooms. So you can see the, the there's no ceiling in here anymore. They're protecting the floor in this particular case. Uh, so they must be reusing the floor, I'm assuming. Um, you can see the new uh, uh, ventilation lines here, the water pipes uh, for the new hot water uh, heat system, uh, new data cabling that's going up. Uh, when the ceiling grid gets put back in, it'll be a new ceiling grid, but new LED light fixtures will be put into the grid. And so when you're talking about economies of scale before, when you go up into the ceiling to run new wiring, uh, and that, that was the other thing, they, they were one of those classic schools that had two outlets in the room and that's it. Um, so they're replacing all the electrical, but you can do that. You drop the ceiling out and, uh, and they also added uh, sprinkler lines in here too, fire sprinkler protection, which they didn't have. Um, but you drop the ceiling out once and you can get up and do all that work. And a lot of those utilities will use similar chases, you know, down hallways and, and what have you. And so you can do all those things at one time, reasonably efficient. Uh, another aspect, so you can see, you know, the new duct work here, they had just the regular unit ventilators like you have in here. New duct work coming in again, your copper lines for the heating system, there's ventilation sprinkler line you can see the cat5 cabling in there i don't see any electrical in there but i know they're replacing the electrical at the same time um this used to have um cabinetry in there you know for storage and that type of thing with a sink so you can see the sink will be going back in but you can see the plumbing for that um this was the library space so it was kind of like a double classroom type of size in that hallway um opening that up like uh, we saw in a few of the pictures with a kind of a glass wall type of feature to make it a little bit more attractive. And then there'll be some other, um, you know, furniture and, and uh, more just a little architectural design type features inside the library space. Um, this was their small gym um, and the 1937 part of the building. So they, don't, they only use it for, for some gym things, but weren't using the stage anymore. So the stage is now blocked up. It'll be a wall, the stage, space that had been there that was relatively not usable because it was a stage um, is now being used as a uh, as a uh, special ed type of room um, because because there was a fair amount of space to be used there um, one thing i found really interesting was all the wood trusses from yeah. from the 30s if, if any of you guys are builders or engineers um, you wonder why sometimes these buildings go up in flames super fast mm -hmm. um, Cafeteria space. So they had put a ceiling in here uh, back in the 70s when we had our energy crisis. And because uh, they wanted to keep the heat down, 
uh, and there wasn't some of the other technologies there. So lo and behold, they wanted to do something to make the cafeteria a little more appealing. You take the ceiling out and you find, you know, that it's already set up for windows and everything. So they'll replace the windows, so they're energy efficient windows um, and, uh, and keep that open. And uh, probably can't see it, I don't think in here, but they're running new HVAC and ventilation stuff along the wall and uh, nice fresh coat of paint and some new tables and you can have almost a brand new type of cafeteria in there. Um, you gotta ask, is that done in one summer? The, all this work is being done in one summer, yes. Wow. You, you, should, you should go there and see the activity, uh, <laughs> but yeah, it is, it is being done in one summer. Um, so yeah. <laughs> this summer is a longer yeah, yeah. Although it was scheduled, it was they did start early, but <laughs> they did start early. But <clears throat> at least at UNESCO, or I should say Site Logic, um, we um, we we've of, of all the jobs that we've done, we've never missed a, a school opening. So uh, we've got some fantastic project managers, but we're not the only ones that do this. I mean, companies that are used to dealing with schools are set up. To perform in short periods of time. Um, so that's the main gym. Uh, so the bleachers have been pulled out, they're replacing the floor. I mean, you know, all kinds of stuff going on there. Again, uh, the stage area that they do still use. Um, now, when it's done, so I, I gotta switch to a different school because this is not done yet, but just you know, pointing out a few things of, of how that looks. So upgraded entryway uh, will will look similar over there. Uh, you can see, uh, and again, this building, I'm trying to think of this building as like a late 40s, 50s type of building. Um, you can see the unit ventilators have been taken out. New windows put in, unit ventilators are taken out, um, which you'd normally see some equipment hanging out underneath the windows here. Not there anymore. All right, when you look inside, new door sets, new cabinetry. All right, here, are somewhat traditional furniture still, um, but you can see how that cleans up, LED lighting. Um, from, from the inside, again, you know, fresh coat of paint, a little bit of uh, architectural feature, new uh, door set to get rid of the, the wood, you know, uh, door sets. Um, again, taking a look at the hallways, you know, uh, nice and bright now, uh, still original floor in, in this particular case, but new ceilings, LED light fixtures. Another look at, at how that looks. Um, again, brightness. Um, little architectural feature here. Uh, this was a retrofit of uh, a school in Minnesota that we did a couple of years ago. Um, so you can see the cafeteria space, um, not, you know, it was okay, it was fine, but not the most welcoming or interesting. Uh, so that's what it changed to after it was done. Uh, we did push the wall out a little bit to give them a little bit more space, but we opened up the amount of window space that they had um, so you got a lot more light in there and the color, right? Just really just makes it that much more interesting. Um, and again, some architectural features that weren't there, giving them a little bit higher ceiling. Um, so it's a, it's a lot more friendly space for kids. Um, same thing here with the library update. Um, so kind of your traditional library, the old orange chairs that I swear to God we had in high school in fifth grade. Um, and uh, so, not, uh, again, it, it's fine for a library, but not the most inviting space. Um, and uh, that's what it ended up being. Uh, again, you still have your, your bookshelves and, and your books, um, but again, changing of furniture, um, a little bit uh, different design of the features. You get your knowledge bar or whatever. <laughs> I can't think of what Apple calls it, but uh, with your computers there. Um, and, uh, and again, it's brighter with the LED lights, with that daylight spectrum, and then the color, you know? Um, and so again, these are not, not uh, super expensive types of things to do, but we're reimagining. So now, um, what I wanted to do is just take again about maybe 20 minutes or so with your group. What surprised you perhaps of any of the stuff that we looked at? Um, what opportunities or limitations do you see in your buildings here? And then what items again kind of rise as a priority? And I thought I was asking again a question about relevance. So you can talk a little bit about relevance if you want to do it. Um, wouldn't, wouldn't, uh, wouldn't mind hearing a little bit about that. So any questions though on the stuff that we looked at? 
Dan had a great question, you know, and Hi. yeah. You, you talked about, a lot about lighting and painting the windows and everything. Mm -hmm. From a safety standpoint, is it bulletproof glass? I mean, yeah, it's not bulletproof it's glass, glass. Um, generally speaking. Um, you you can get bulletproof glass. It's extremely expensive. You can get a film that you can put on glass that's bulletproof. And, uh, a lot of schools have gone to that just in their main entry way, at least. Um, but um, I shouldn't say a lot. I, I, in Wisconsin, they had a grant program, so they gave schools money to do that. But um, it, uh, for what it's worth, the film company owner was really good friends with the governor, so I think there was a little something there. Um, but um, that's why all the schools in Wisconsin got the, the film. Um, but anyway, what they will say oftentimes now and again, there's no right or wrong answer exactly from a security standpoint. So there's some different schools of thought um, with research behind them. So again, there's not one right answer. Um, but where, where a lot of this is going these days is the more visibility that you have, so you understand what's coming at you, what's going on around you, gives you more time to react and prepare to react. Um, and so that's where we're seeing a lot more schools, not sorry for that intention, but are not minding having the glass because they have a better idea of what's going on around them and their surroundings. And so they're not taken by surprise, if you will. And uh, they're able to, again, prepare and react quicker if, if there is something going on. Um, and so, uh, so yeah, so that's, that, that's kind of where that direction with, with the glasses can go. I, I don't know. Yeah. Not, yeah, there's so many competing factors that I'm talking about that school and charge through that. The walking trail looks great. And you kind of wander around and see what great idea. And all I can think is I do not want him to have to come across the restaurant right. even I, after hours. Like it wasn't even during the day, but after hours. I was computers and all sorts of I, I don't want random people walking through the building. So it seemed really cool. I said, what is that? The window seemed really cool, but then honestly. <laughs> there's trade there's trade offs with everything. On the inside, right? you know, the wooden doors, you put a little thing over the window and they can't see in, but if your whole wall is a window, right. where do you hide the kids? And and again, it depends on your, your methodology. So a lot of schools have gone to and I a lot of schools have gone to to now um, I forget the name of the program. I don't know, I'm surprised I forgot it, but um where you're not locking yourself in your class. Unless the, the threat is in your immediate area, the kids are, are instructed to flee, right? Um, yeah, else. yeah, that's it. Um, and so, um, so there's not as, m not as many kids trying to batten down in a classroom. Um, and so, uh, I, again, there, there, there's, there's payoffs, you know, um, there's tra or trade offs, I should say. Um, um, I have a question about yeah. um, I think one of the biggest things that I that kind of realized is different from when I went to school, um, that there are teacher's aides. Um, you know, when I went to school, there was no teacher's aides. There was a teacher and a phone card here or whatever. Now, uh, like how many teacher's aides or how many are in our buildings and how does that affect how you use spaces beyond mm -hmm. how? Yes, I, Gosh, that's a, uh, number is a good question. I was just looking at this the other day. Do you know the number of kids? Right around 50? Yeah, a lot. So we have, um, we call them associates or paraprofessionals, and we generally only have them. We have a couple, like we have someone in the library, because we only have one librarian for the uh, two, two librarians, one and a half for the district. So we have associates in the library to help with finding books and things like that. Um, one in each, um, and we have um, like health associates. So instead of having a nurse in every building, we have a health associate. And we have a couple lunch and supervisors that work just a couple hours a day. But other than that, every associate classroom aid we have is for special education, all of the field. So except uh, preschool, you're required to have one in preschool. Um, but I think, and I think we have one in community. But otherwise, all the rest of those are supporting special education. And so um, usually it's to help sort of kids from being in the regular classroom and they have some support. And sometimes they're in a small group setting and we need the associate to be with them. Academically, sometimes it's for behavior. So the associate will follow eight students all 
all day long and be their main support person. So I don't know if it really impacts our use of space. It's been, it has happened before that we we do a better job now deploying associates because what happened a few times when I first came is you can have students who have, we call it a student specific associate one on one for behavior or for academics, kids with serious cognitive needs who need help all day long. They, you know, they get lost in the building or that kind of thing. And so it's happened before where I've walked into a small space with a teacher, three students, and three associates. Okay, hold on. We got way too many adults in this room. It's it's too cramped, and um, so we don't do that anymore. Um, but uh, I don't know that it impacts space much more than that because they don't have they're with the students. They don't have their own like office or workspace. Did that answer your question? Yeah, I just I was just thinking what was what's different. Than yeah. Our, some some buildings have those for regular classrooms, but not very often. And ours are always for, except those few cases, like that, always to support special education students, but to help them be integrated in the regular class. So those associates are there for in every, I don't know, every class, but most. Yeah, when you think of it, we only have 114 teachers with 50 associates. So, big challenge. Yeah, I want to do one. Other questions? So again, so some of these things here are things that you can think about. You know, if you're gonna do the utility work, obviously as you saw what it looked like when you're doing the utility work, it does open up again opportunities to make changes sometimes. Um, so um, so what surprised you? What opportunities or limitations do you see in the buildings? Uh, you can, uh, what, what items rise as priorities? And then you can talk a little bit about relevance as well and how doing some of these things maybe provides relevance uh, to the to the, the real world if you will. All right. All right. Everybody good? All right. So um, so what Anything surprise you in what you saw as far as what kind of modern learning environments look like? And there's not a lot of consistency, right? I mean, it's not just this is the way to do it. Um, a lot of flexibility there. But what what the, what kind of surprised you when you when you saw what other schools are doing? Uh, we can do a lot with lighting, paint, furniture. A lot with lighting, paint, furniture. <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, yes. Okay. And then the same with just okay. cosmetic additions. I mean, things that, like you said, bring in some bright color paint or something neat on the ceiling, you know, whatever it might be that really, when you enter a room, it um, just changes the feel of the space. What can you do to change the feel of the space so that the people entering that space, you know, view it differently, not as something that's, you know, classroom. Mm -hmm. So, and then we had the, uh, just the use of glass to feel connected to everyone else, but still have separate spaces. You know, that really showed in the uh, movie as well. Yeah. Good, great look. How about you guys? Yeah, I guess just the potential for an old building to look like that. Mm -hmm. you know? um, I think that was great thinking and executing that. Um, and then the other thing too is the idea of the hallway space being reimagined. Um, you know, I said specifically too for the high school. I mean, I know there's a lot of high schoolers that like to go and use their lockers. Yeah. Right. Yep. And so we're, see, we're seeing that yeah. a lot less lockers going to the high school and, yeah. and putting them in different places than just the hallways because they're maybe only used for a couple hours as yeah. opposed to, you know, an assignment, assigned lock. Sorry. Just thinking of that space being mm -hmm. utilized differently. Yeah, for sure. And you'll never get rid of all your hallways, of course, but we've seen some schools have up to 30% of the square footage is hallway space. It's not used, but you're still eating it, you're still lighting it, you know, maintaining it, waxing the floors. <laughs> <laughs> so, how about you guys? We like the use of the hallway for learning spaces too. I guess you're a little more cautionary. <laughs> Uh, we felt like the open spaces kind of led to noise and distractions and how does 
gig beneath the traditional sort of setting actually learn in that environment? And does that also lead to uh, a lack of respect everyone around them because it's kind of a, it seems like a free for all uh, at, at times. Um, it definitely requires more teacher collaboration. And then also the question about how does all this collaborative space actually lead to higher learning? Right. So, so you still need to have curriculum, you still need to have the programming to, to do that. Um, the space really is only there to support what you're trying to do from a programming standpoint. So, um, you know, that, that, uh, that depends on the direction of the school district. So, and part of the reason that we're not looking to try to design a building, you know, here in this group, but really give, you know, the higher level thinking of this is really kind of the direction we should go. And then some of those designs can follow more intentionally what programming and curriculum you're doing on the school. So, um, what about opportunities and limitations? Uh, did you see? I'll, I'll, I'll let you guys start this time. Uh, well, we feel that there's a reasonable amount of space to make collaborative spaces. Uh, we think if we started picking an HVAC system, we could reconfigure the room because of all the uh, decor already happening, and we could go with the noise solutions too. Um, but we do feel like there's some political limitations. Mm -hmm. And care to expand on that? Or? <laughs> that's one of the things I've heard from people I've talked to just from, um, kind of goes back to the last time we had a job in our firm that Phil and I was looking at pretty much a new school. And I think there was room for people to come. So the school would have done that then and wouldn't be here today. Mm -hmm. So trying to make sure that gets addressed if there's a need for such a thought and it's explaining that this is more than just fixing something, I mean, it's fixing, but how do we reimagine where we construct some of these facilities so they have another 50 years versus just making some addition to fix it? What, what's the real value proposition? What's what's the long-term yes. benefits here? I think there's a sentiment in the community, at least my experience, there's a sentiment in the community where they, people want you to Show them that you're making the most of what you've got. Mm -hmm. Doing your homework and getting the most value out of it. Right. The dollar, so to speak. Yeah. So that would definitely be a must. Okay. How about you guys? That was also one of ours, like just the community getting them on board with some of these ideas mm -hmm. and seeing the, the need for that. Um, and then we were also maybe curious as far as the teachers feedback for these more these spaces of all together like is that something that teachers are wanting to see um you know, you know or the force on them that, right here's the word principal talk about that it's a size yeah mm -hmm. but i've never been to the time it was i guess i've been there in front of the line something like that so right yeah. Yeah, and, and one size doesn't fit all. So you saw a wide variety of things here, probably a little bit more extreme, just again to kind of open up, up that line. The the project I showed you that was kind of under construction, um, they maintained their regular classroom. They, they, had, they did other improvements, you know, from the library media center improvements, obviously the paint, the furniture, the you know, all that kind of stuff, windows and the energy stuff. Um, but they maintained their, their classrooms. Um, and, and that suited them well, right? So there, there isn't a right or a uh, right or wrong answer or one answer. Um, and um, I I know that we've engaged with your staff um, from a site logic standpoint a while ago. They probably didn't go quite to that level of detail, but if the school board looks like they want to go that direction, there would be a whole part of our process where they do get that teacher feedback. Yeah, that's a good question. I'm just listening to all of this attention to this stuff. All the things you guys have said, like, yeah, we need to make sure we have. We haven't asked the teacher, because that isn't really like, hey, this is what we want to do. We want to get that. Right. Absolutely, you are so right. We need to make sure we ask them, what do you need? And what do you want? And do some sort of balance. But we haven't yet. We asked them kind of what are the problems with your current space and stuff. But I'm just listening to what everybody's saying, like, yeah, that's something we need to make sure we remember to do. I think it's important to remember too. Teachers are so innovative with what they have. 
Yeah. And they they just get to a point where they just don't ask. It's like, well, yeah, I can't have that. I mean, they, they can't even imagine it. Mm -hmm. Right. To spend this, and that's what they work with, and they just don't complain. Right. That's right. actually a problem to tell you the truth, because we we ask every year for teachers to put in what their summer maintenance requests are, and we want them to look for things like there's a broken ceiling tile or this one's stinging. The rest they will not ask. We have to have the principals walk around and go write that down. Because they won't ask. It's okay, so we'll make you. Like, yeah. yeah, I'm like, people, you ask for that. Maybe we'll get you a new carpet. I didn't know you needed a new carpet, but they will not ask for anything. They are amazing. You have to say to them, I, I want you to tell us what you need, and they won't. That's a whole new mindset, really, for them. So, great point. Yeah. Or you get to. Uh, limitations. We had this structural changes that came a bit uh season made like where the low bearing walls for your facility um if we're doing more of a collaborative space like what are the fire marshal rules with that as far as getting out and everything um are there going to be any financial limitations and um like others related will there be any teacher pushback to it you know as far as would they like to move to more collaborative space um, or would they and maybe it will depend on and then for opportunities, um, just redoing all the HVAC and everything, doing all the mechanical above, like we saw in the video, that would be a huge opportunity. And then just the design possibilities, I mean, basically the sky's the limit. I mean, anything you can dream of can be done, you know, within reason. And then just finding what the right mix is, yeah. budget-wise, you know, politically, teacher um, agreement, safety. Um, so what are the things that you saw there that we saw, we heard before the mechanical system, the utility related things, we rose to the top as a priority for you guys. Um, from the tour discussion, is anything that we talked about here seem to raise, you know, raise up as, as, as a need or a should have? Um, that doesn't need to even be specifics, but just based on what you've seen your, your Current condition being, and what you saw some of these things. What what are some of those more important things? Uh, well, we just said the biggest thing is weighing the cost of upgrading the old versus replacing the new. Yeah. And and what I would say is some states have some standards on that. Even so, Minnesota, for instance, the state reviews um, the referendum plans and, and those types of things as well. What what which is going to support, they won't completely block it, but if they say no, that doesn't make sense, and you go to a higher threshold as far as votes that you win that referendum. Um, but typically, what Minnesota will do, and um, we'll probably similarly, just in, in our um, engineering sense, uh, once you're starting to put in about 60% uh, to 70% of what you would be in your remodeling, you're generally better off right now. Yeah. Um, and so and we'll look at what some of these costs are that are related to these things in the next two meetings if we go through that process. So you'll see what those things are. Um, I don't believe, I, I haven't taken a look at that detail that the numbers recently, so I, I don't want to speak out of turn, but I don't think you guys are at that spot here um, that you're, you're approaching that 60 or 70 percent mark. Um, but um, but that, that's usually about the percentage. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what you said? Big number. Yeah. Yeah. For for new, you're saying? Oh, for new school. For new? Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. How, yeah. How, how many kids do you have in the high school again? Uh, about 400. 400, yeah. So I'm trying to think. I'm quite a trouble. Yeah, you're probably talking. Yeah, you're probably talking for high school for that side. I'm guessing, I don't know, thirty-five, forty million dollars. Kind of interesting. We did have when we first started doing the facility. Could, yeah, it could be a little higher. higher. I mean, it depends on what you got in. Yeah, so. we had um, we had a little bit. A couple people um said to us after we were talking about it. Was it wasn't nice to do something anyway. Some people wrote back and said, "Well, I saw an article in the paper that Iowa City just built a new school for whatever." 
five million dollars. Why can't we do that here? And we actually had one of the um, architects kind of lay out. Here's what inflation has been since they started. I'm looking at Don like this guy talking way out of my league here. Sorry, Don, but like here's what inflation is. And then with some of the things happening in the world right now, it's the eight percent inflation, and then and the interest rate, and then show how a new building was much, much more expensive than what they were to show. So I'm not saying I want or don't want that, but it was it was something that looking at the surface you thought. I can do the math on that. Yeah. No, it's not. I can't do math. There are so many different ways to. You just helped with the new school construction. Yeah. <laughs> How much was that? In what town and what size? Well, it, it, it varies. I mean, so when you read those things, you know, I have not disclosed the huge school stuff, but the elementary, when you read what the elementary goes for, is a lot different than the middle school and it's a whole lot different than the high school. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, for the way I'm saying, our first hundred million dollar school in Iowa was built in Washington. You know, just past. How much did you hundred million dollars? Hundred million. For what grade? High school. High school. You know, and that's the second grade. Yeah. Two and I, yeah, I, I don't know how big that one was, but I know we're building a high school right now that's sized for about eighteen hundred kids, some seventeen, eighteen hundred kids. Um, so it's obviously much bigger than what you need here. That's why I was trying to kind of equate numbers, but. Uh, that was 140 million. You don't choose that. <laughs> 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 no, but, <laughs> but you're not. You're, but you're not. You're not. Yeah. You know, you're not. You're not in that realm. Right. 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 When he when he got a high school that's got that many kids in it, he's got a much yeah. larger yeah. community and yeah. more land. And so. You know what? I'll just throw this out there too. It wasn't quite, but. I just had a conversation today with Tim Vick because the University of Iowa and Irving Mills, the city's been selected by the University of Iowa, I mean, like my golf in it, um, to, to partner with them for the year to pick selection process. And they will send um, students and faculty, and I think they'll do 20 projects for the city. And so one of the projects we talked about today was marketing for the schools. And um, this is when we need to market some of the fantastic things that are happening. But we just really started talking about. And we've talked about this before, but it helps if you remember. In schools, those really impressed. You know, you want the teaching to be really good. That's people's first impression is what matters. And then the teaching comes later, but you don't want to have to work against that first impression. And so if people are coming into town to look for a new business here or moving their family here because our, our employers need workers and they see the school that looks really great, that supports the city getting more people. And then when the city gets more people, then they have kids who come to schools and we get more funding, which supports, I mean, it just really flows together. And it's a detriment if the schools don't look good when people come on to it. And, um, and I will tell you that when the hospital comes and says, you know, hey, can we provide a tour to this new position moving into town? I think, where should I take them? I'm going to take them to the science. Now I'm moving. Julie, you guys came to see the middle school. I was just like, sorry. You really have some great things going on, but the first thing you see is like, wow, this is not the greatest. This is luckily you gave us a shot. But I mean, seriously, it is a concern to the city bringing in people and then to the schools as well if it they really work together. If, if Brian were here, and he sends his love, although I don't know how much really he's in Alaska fishing right now. Um, but anyway, um, he would he, he often says that, it, you know, it's, it's billboard education. You know, it, it matters what your building looks like when you're on the street and what the first hundred feet inside the front door is, because that's where people make their impression, you know, or that makes the impression on people. Unfortunately, I mean, it's not really what counts, but but that's where people are. So. You're, you're absolutely right. And the other thing there that you'll often hear us talking about once you get to more of the referendum side of things, and you know, if, if you guys do have a referendum and you have a vote yes group or whatever, you know, we tend to talk about it there too, is um, you know, your schools are a direct reflection uh, of the community that they serve, right? Um, and so that's where when people drive by and they take a look at the schools and they're like, okay, so that's telling me something about the community. Now, the question is, is it telling them something accurate or not? You know? Um, so anyway, um, I, I don't know where I even left off here. You went. You went and that was it. <laughs> <laughs>
Okay. You guys want to, I, I know we're, we're running up against time, but we've had some good conversation here. So, uh, our caps was just updating basically all the logistics HVAC, mechanical, water, lighting. Okay. That's the top. Uh, Tom was the high school bio lab. That's really bad. Gotcha. All right. <laughs> um, and how about you guys? We had the same. Uh, and when we do the HVAC lighting, and like all that stuff, the and again, take advantage of some of the economies of, of scale. If we're going in and we're doing this work, let's take a look at doing some of the other work. You know, our budget can support it. And we'll talk next time when we talk about budget. There's that fine line. You know, we want to make decisions based on what's best for kids as our priority. And those questions I add up really are, are in order for a reason. Um, but the reality is that, you know, you do have to be responsible to a budget. And so um, we'll take a look at what those things are. And oftentimes we'll get to a point where this is what we believe the community can accept as far as an impact. And so then what does that allow us to do? Um, and so we'll, we'll look at it. With the rest. So, um, any other parting closing comments, thoughts, ideas? I never showed my last slide, so I'm going to this time. <laughs> Still trying to get kids from that side to that side. Um, and our next meeting is the 29th. So hopefully everybody got that the 29th and then uh, a couple weeks off in August. And then uh, I forgot the exact date, but it's the, third, it's the third Wednesday in August and then the first Wednesday in September, I believe. 19th of August and the third is September 2nd, 2nd of September. And then we're talking about um, part of the discussion is, uh, and we're not tonight, so I'm trying to go talk to another one of the meetings about how do you want to present the school board? Right. Like another the district group wants to do that. When would that be? Sometimes we have uh, the thought that we, we talked about with Tom was we'll try to schedule, we haven't talked to the school board about it yet, but we'll try to schedule what we call a work session, which is a public meeting, but no decisions are made in the work session. But then you can devote your time to talking about all the things that we talked about. If we try to cram it into a regular school board meeting, probably isn't really enough time to talk about it. So if we have it that way, then that means we can schedule it at the convenience of the group. We wouldn't have to do a September 4th. Okay. No? Other than that, thanks for being here. I can't great to, great to actually have a yeah. meeting in person for a while. Yeah. I love the conversation. Okay. Thanks for sticking with us for these crazy times. Really glad you're here. Thanks.